So I'll hand you over to uh, our events officer, Alison Leaf, to uh, introduce the speakers. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, well, for anyone who doesn't know me, which may be quite a few tonight, I'm Alison Leaf. I'm the events officer for the Oxford Command Group. It's great to see people here, and it's a real pleasure to be introducing our speaker tonight, um, Dr. Kerry Langridge, who's going to be talking to us all the way from Brazen, north of Scotland. Um, I'm a bit echoey as well, I'm afraid. I don't know why, but um, I'll switch my mobile off. Um, in March 2019, uh, the Mammal Society annual conference was in Glasgow, and being in Scotland, there was actually a whole session of four talks devoted to Scottish wildcats. And as I grew up in Scotland, this was particularly um, uh, special for me. And when I spoke to Kerry afterwards, I was delighted that she said she would be happy to come down at some time in the future and talk to us at the Oxfordshire Mammal Group. Now, about six months prior to that, Kerry Broom from the Royal Society of Biology had um, come to our stand at the um, open day at Sutton Courtney uh, Education Centre. And we'd hatched this idea that it'd be good to have a joint meeting. So the hybridization in Scottish wildcat seemed an attractive subject, quite biological, of interest to a lot of people, because of course the Scottish wildcat is our most endangered British mammal. And um, so it seemed a good topic to do jointly. So before I say any more about tonight's actual speaker, I'm just going to hand over to Kerry Broom, who's the secretary of the Thames Valley branch of the Royal Society of Biology. And I'd like to say a big welcome to your members who've joined us tonight. And we would just like to hear a little bit more about the society and um, its aims and, and what you do. So welcome Kerry and all your members. Thank you. Um, I should say I'm not the secretary. I'm just a committee member for our branch. Um, so I'm from the Thames Valley branch of the Royal Society of Biology. Um, I'm just going to share my screen if I can. Um, and I can just talk through um, a couple of um, A couple of points about the, the society. So we're a national society and uh, we say that we're the UK's leading professional association and we represent a uni unified voice for biology. So we've got around um, 18,000 individuals. Um, it may actually be more than that by now, I would imagine, because I think these slides are slightly out of date. But we have um, 90 uh, learned societies and other organisations that we represent. Um, you can see on the left there um, is a link to join if you're interested. but um, some of the things that we do, we advise government policy and influence the policy. Um, we are very interested in advancing education and professional development. Um, and as part of this, um, we have a CPD scheme. Um, and if you're collecting CPD points, you might be interested to know that listening to this lecture will give you CPD six CPD points. So you might want to put that down on your CPD record. So we support people working in the life sciences and we engage and encourage public interest um, in the life sciences across schools and um, different workplaces. So because we're a national society, we have many regional branches and we are the Thames Valley branch. Um, and here's just a, a short list of some activities that we've got coming up um, over the next year, which you may be interested in. So I've just picked out some of the ones that are sort of animally and um, well, things that you'd probably be interested in. At the moment, all our um, events are going to be virtual because we don't know what the coronavirus situation will be. But um, if you want to know more about our branch, you can email us there. You've got our email address. We've got a Facebook page and we have an Instagram page. So please do check those um, pages out or email us if you would like to know some more information. Thank you. And let's back to Alison, I believe. Thanks. Um, great, well, it's lovely to have you all here. And so with no further ado, I would like to introduce Kerry Langridge. Um, when we had the session at the Mammal Society, there were four talks. And Kerry, we had history, biology, all sorts of things, but Kerry's talk was very much focused on 
actually finding Scottish wildcats and what can we do to help them? So um, since that time, uh, almost 18, over 18 months ago, Carrie has actually been the recipient of a Churchill Fellowship and has been traveling Europe, talking, meeting wildcats and catty people all across Europe and finding out um, the latest in what can be done to try and preserve this iconic mammal in the UK. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Carrie Langrid to talk about hybridization and the Scottish wildcat. Give us a little introduction, Carrie, to yourself and then on with the subject. And thanks very much. Okay, I'm on. Um, hi everyone, thank you for coming uh, on a, whatever the day this is, Monday, Monday night. Um, I really appreciate your coming uh, and listening to this talk. Um, so my name is Kerry Langridge. Uh, I am trained as a behavioral researcher, a research scientist in behavioral ecology. Uh, my PhD was on cuttlefish uh, and visual communication between cuttlefish and fish. Um, and then I worked as a field ecologist in Scotland for a few years. And then for some reason, I worked for cats protection for a while as an education officer. And then uh, five years ago, I worked as a project officer for Scottish Wildcat Action, um, which was the, the one of the first national partnership projects for wildcats in Scotland. Um, and I became completely hooked completely obsessed with wildcats um, and uh, so my talk tonight is about hybridization and Scottish wildcats and I will share my screen because I'm already starting to talk about things that I've got pictures for uh, so here we go okay is that successful Okay, is that is that good? Thumbs up, me, Bob. <laughs> you can see my screen. That looks good to me. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to talk about my favourite topic, which is hybridisation uh, and Scottish wildcats. Uh, and as I mentioned, I uh, work for Scottish Wildcat Action. Um, so some of this uh, some of this content um, is going to uh, involves Scottish Wildcat Action, and then the rest is from uh, my work, uh, Churchill Fellowship, uh, which was looking at hybridization in European wildcats. Um, sorry, it's a bit annoying this because this sharing bar is blocking the top of the screen, but uh, it says people have entered the waiting room. It's just covering some of the slides. <laughs> Probably you can't see that. Anyway, we shall carry on. Um, so uh, the talk outline, so I'll talk for about 45 minutes. I usually have way too many slides, uh, so I will try to uh, talk quickly and there'll be plenty of time uh, to ask questions afterwards. So I'm gonna talk part one will be about Scottish wildcat population history and part two, I'm gonna talk about the causes of hybridization, including some of the work from the European uh, wildcat research. Uh, okay. So let's start with some background. Some of you probably know a lot of this already. So I'm not gonna to dwell too much on what a wildcat is, but a wildcat is uh, one of many different subspecies of cats with a distribution across uh, Europe, Asia, sorry, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, and uh, this cat here, which is a Chinese step cat. So uh, I'm gonna assume that you can see my mouse. Uh, this one over here, uh, next to the Europe uh, is the European wildcat, Felis sylvestris. Uh, this is the species that we're interested in. And there is another cat of interest, which is this one, Felis libica. And libica is the ancestor of all domesticated cats. Uh, Felis libica is the uh, African desert cat. Um, and these others, South African wildcat, Asiatic wildcat, are subspecies of Felis libica. So the one that we are interested in is this one here uh, by Europe. This is a lot more difficult when you're not in person and you can't point to things. Um, anyway, hopefully you can see my mouse. So this is the European wildcat. This is the one that we're interested in um, because the Scottish wildcat is a European wildcat. So Scottish wildcats are Phyllis sylvestris, sylvestris relating to forest. So they are forest cats. 
And you can see that they are kind of gray brown. Um, they have darker striping. They have a bushy blunt tail with a black tip and rings. And they are within the same kind of size range as domestic cats. They may historically have been bigger in the past, but modern populations, they're the same size range as domestic cats. We don't think of size as being a, a significant difference. So the Scottish wildcat is the most northern subpopulation of the European wildcat. And this is a map of the distribution of European wildcat. You can see that uh, this is relatively old from the last uh, IUCN red list assessment. So that has been updated. Well, it is about to be updated, but they are spread over Western Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Ranges have declined and increased since this was produced. Um, but our Scottish one is the most northerly subpopulation. This is the, uh, the type specimen for Scottish wildcat, which is from Morriston. You can see actually it looks a little bit hybrid. Uh, well, you'll maybe be able to see that uh, later. Um, but it was previously described as Felis sylvestris grampia or Felis grampia, the Scottish wildcat, but it has been reclassified. It is the same species as, as the European cat. So our European cat ancestors arrived on mainland Britain after the last ice age. So when there was a land bridge around seven to 9,000 years ago. So originally, oh, and sorry, this is, there's a separate subpopulation here, which is Phyllis sylvestris uh, caucasica, which is in the Caucasus. So originally the Scottish wildcat was a British wildcat. It was found all over mainland Britain. And the British wildcat underwent the same kind of history as the wildcat on the rest of the European continent, which is a history of persecution and habitat loss and population decline. And one of the most intensive periods of population decline was between 1700 and 1900. So this is the distribution of Phyllis sylvestris by 1800. So you can see it's extinct from most of England already. We think it was probably extinct from Southeast England by the 15th century. And the causes of the extinction are hunting for sport and for fur and persecution of vermin. So they were persecuted for eating livestock. And it's also uh, deforestation, massive habitat loss um, due to uh, burning forests for, for charcoal, uh, for timber, clearing space for agriculture. So that was the distribution by 1800. There were low population densities in the north of England, in Wales and in Southern Scotland. And the remaining, the main population was in the north of Scotland. By 1850, the population has, has retracted hugely. And that's partly due to the rise of the gamekeeping estates in Scotland. So in the Victorian era, when they built the railways to Scotland and all the rich people would go to Scotland and shoot grouse, they developed all these huge areas of grouse moor. And an important part of grouse moor management was predator control. Predator control was very, very intensive for all predator species and it was widespread and hundreds and thousands of predators were killed every year. There were 25,000 gamekeepers working um, at the peak um, of this grouse ball management. By 1915, the wildcat was uh, reduced to a tiny relic population in the far northwest of Scotland. And this is far from optimal habitat. This is very poor wildcat habitat generally, um, but there, it would have been the last refuge. And if it hadn't been for the First World War, they would have been extinct at this time. So because of the war, the gamekeepers were all conscripted and they went off to fight in the war. And a lot of the estates uh, closed at that point. And so begins an era of population recovery. So with the persecution pressure reduced, uh, the wildcat population was able to expand um, and recover some of its former range. And that coincided with a period of um, reforestation, massive reforestation in Scotland um, after the war when the Forestry Commission was formed um, and huge areas were reforested and some of these early conifer plantations were quite good habitat for small mammals. This was also a time when the rabbit population was exploding because the persecution pressure meant there were no predators and there were no people there shooting them. So you've got a huge rabbit population explosion. So wildcats were able to recover a lot of their former range uh, in the first half of the 20th century. This survey was done 
between 1983 and 1987. Now, even at this point when this survey was done, although it looks like the coverage is good, populations had already started to decline again by the 80s. So this particular survey, which was the Nature Con Conservancy survey, uh, they noted that a lot of these populations were very low population density and declining. And it was this survey that actually prompted uh, the era of wildcat conservation. So the population was declining and it was declining rapidly across the range. And the main threats were persecution, continued persecution of predators. So there were fewer gamekeepers now, but there was far better technology for gamekeepers. So we have thermal imaging and uh, the widespread use of snaring, uh, poison baits. So these are indiscriminate methods. So wildcats were still being killed by the hundreds across the whole of the north of Scotland. Habitat loss continued. In terms of commercial forestry, a lot of plantations were now mature plantations, which aren't particularly good habitat uh, for small mammals. Um, agricultural intensification meant that some traditional farming practices that were good for small mammals were now being abandoned. So habitat was being lost on a, on a large scale. There was a huge decline in prey, rodents because of uh, agricultural intensification, but also rabbits and primarily rabbits. We know in Scotland that wildcats historically have been relatively dependent on rabbits, at least in the past hundred years or so. And in the 1950s, there was the outbreak of myxomatosis and rabbit populations crashed everywhere. Road mortality uh, is a big problem for predators generally, but particularly for cats. Um, and one of the more insidious threats for wildcats that began to escalate in the 1970s and 1980s was hybridization with domestic cats. And disease transmission is also a factor, but I'm not gonna discuss that too much in this talk. Because hybridization is sort of the main um, area of interest. So this culminated finally in legal protection for the wildcat in 1988, they were added to schedule five of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. But what is interesting about the legal protection for wildcats is that it was effectively worthless, primarily because of hybridization. So the legal protection did not extend to hybrids. And there was a famous test case not soon after the legal protection, um, well soon after, sorry, uh, in 1990, when um, a farmer was taken to court at uh, Stonehaven Sheriff Court for killing three wildcats. And they called an expert witness who was unable to say beyond reasonable doubt that they were wildcats and not hybrids. So they couldn't prosecute that case. And since then, there has never been a successful prosecution of anybody killing a wildcat. So hybridization is a big problem for conservation. So we'll just take a minute to look a bit more at hybridization and what it actually means and some of the terminology. So you've got your parental species, your parental taxa, which in this case is a wildcat and a domestic cat. And hybridization is interbreeding of previously genetically distinct species or populations. And in some cases, the offspring from that interbreeding might not be fertile. And if that's the case, then the hybridization ends there. It's a failed reproductive attempt, um, but it doesn't go any further. That generation is called the first generation, first filial generation or F1. Those are F1 hybrids and they are by definition 50% genetic information from each parent taxa. But in the case of uh, wildcat hybrids, the offspring are fertile, which means that they can interbreed with each other and produce an F2 generation and that can carry on. F3 generation, F4 generation or any mixture. And what we also get uh, is back crossing. So back crossing is where hybrid offspring will interbreed with one of the parental taxa. Uh, and we call this would be a first generation back cross to wildcat. And you can have a first generation back cross to domestic cat. And back crossing, uh, what back crossing does is it results in gene flow, gene transfer between these different species. So when the F1 hybrid breeds with the wildcat, it introduces domestic cat genes into the wildcat population. And that is called introgression or intragressive hybridization. And intragressive hybridization is sort of the worst case hybridization. 
in terms of conservation because it results in genetic swamping, genetic dilution of the rare species. And it, I should say that obviously hybridization is a very important natural evolutionary process, but it becomes a conservation concern when it involves generally introduced non-native species, often domesticated species, and their impacts on the native species. So that's briefly hybridization between wildcats and domestic cats. So it was in the 70s when hybridization started to attract a bit more attention. And Corbett, who did one of the first behavioral studies of wildcats in Northern Scotland, he studied wildcats at Glantana Estate in Aberdeenshire. And this is one of his photos and he identifies a wildcat in the top and a hybrid underneath with a tapered tail and indistinct tail bands. And throughout the 70s and 80s, and particularly the 90s, we know that hybridization increased. The recent genetic evidence suggests that actually that was the intensive period of hybridization. Before that, we thought it might have been when they, when they recolonized after the war, but the recent genetic evidence suggests that wasn't the case. Although there were obviously past episodes, historic episodes of hybridization. Darwin talks about hybrids in 1868 and gamekeepers talk about them at the end of the 18th century. But the acceleration, the rate and the extent of hybridization was nowhere near previously uh, what, it, what it was in the 80s and 90s. So it became really important to be able to identify a wildcat. You can't conserve something if you can't say what it is. So we had to be able to identify wildcats. And there'd been research across the continent for decades, looking at differentiating wildcats from domestic cats. And there were already techniques based on morphology. So these were based on skull uh, shape differences and also gut length uh, was a good indicator. But it's more difficult to differentiate wildcats, domestic cats and their hybrids. And what you need as well is you need some way of doing it on a live animal. It's not that much use being able to do it once it's dead because you want to be able to tell the gamekeeper what they can shoot and what they can't shoot. Particularly because in Scotland, lethal feral cat control is legal and you need to be able to do that. Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you can still hear me. Um, but essentially you need to be able to do that on a living animal. So pelage assessment uh, was developed. So this was done by Andrew Kitchener at the National Museum Scotland and he published this in 2005. And what Andrew did was take all of his museum specimens and look at all the morphological measurements. And he correlated that with the pelage characters uh, on the pelage or the fur of the wildcat. We also have genetic assessments, the genetic test. That wasn't developed until later. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a little while. But this pelage scoring tool provided a systematic standardized way of identifying a wildcat and it was adopted by subsequent research and conservation projects. And just to run through how it works, Kitchener identified seven main features that identify a wildcat. The dorsal line must stop, it must be present, and it must stop at the base of the tail. There must be a blunt club-shaped tail with a black tip, between three and five rings, distinct rings on the tail that are separate. Lines, stripes on the side, not spots, not spots on the rump either, it should be relatively stripy. Four dark distinct wavy bands on the top of the head and two shoulder stripes. Those are the C seven key pelage features. And what we do is score them out of three. So a one is a domestic cat, two is a hybrid and three is a wild cat. So your maximum total score is 21. That's a perfect wild cat. And all the time I've worked with wildcats, we've never found a cat that scored 21. Andrew Kitchener proposed a threshold of 19 out of 21 for a wildcat. Most conservation research since then has adopted more relaxed criteria. And the project that I've been involved with in conservation at the moment uh, uses a score of 17 and up as a wildcat. So Scottish wildcat conservation began from 2000 onwards. In 2004, 
the Scottish Wildcat, the first conservation action plan was published by David MacDonald, Mike Daniels and Andrew Kitchener and colleagues. And that identified persecution and hybridization as the main risks to wildcats. And they made extensive recommendations for conservation action based on all the years of research that had gone before. But that actually was never implemented, although it did significantly inform all the future work, including the 2007-2012 Species Action Framework that was coordinated by Scottish Natural Heritage, which is now Nature Scott. And it included a program of work uh, involving national and local surveys and practical conservation action. It was a huge program of work between that period of time. And it included the 2009-2012 Cairngorms Wildcat Project, which was also known as Highland Tiger. And that was essentially a trial of these conservation actions. And part of what it did, this was a survey uh, under the Species Action Framework in 2008. You can see that the distribution of wildcats is already massively reduced. Those blue dots are probable records and the white ones are possible ones. So even then, this isn't a very definitive survey, um, but it was systematically done. So this indicates a significant uh, range reduction from previous surveys. Kerry Kilshaw also did a lot of survey work during this time period, uh, and this is published 2015. This was 27 camera trap surveys across the whole of the north of Scotland, uh, looking for wildcats and calculating population densities, but Kerry found a lack of cats generally across the range. So in 2013, the Conservation Action Plan for Scottish Wildcat was done and it was a national partnership uh, that was implemented under the umbrella name Scottish Wildcat Action. The Scottish Wildcat Action is the project that I worked for as a project officer. It ran from 2015 to 2020. It involved two programs of work. One was ex situ, which is managing the captive population. That was led by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. The second program of work that I worked for was led by uh, SNH and it was in situ work in priority areas. So these were identified via years of previous surveys as any areas that might have cats left in. And the green ones are the ones that were actually, uh, well, that lasted to the end. Strathan here was uh, ditched after two years of surveys, didn't find any cats. Uh, and these three uh, candidate areas were also dropped because there were no cats found in them. The aim of SWA was to halt the decline of the wildcats within five years. And the program of work was monitoring, and we did the largest ever camera trap surveys across the north of Scotland in the priority areas. All volunteer run with 80 cameras, 85 cameras, and they were repeated over between three and five years to look at the wild living cat population in all of these areas. We maintained a sightings database from across the whole of the north of Scotland, collected roadkill, we took genetic samples from all the wild living cats, and we GPS collared uh, wild cats, which is cats that are 17 and above on that Pellish score. That's what we were calling wild cats. And we also aimed to reduce the threats in these priority areas. So we trained gamekeepers in wildcat ID, promoted precautionary predator control, we looked at habitat management with forestry and farming, uh, raised awareness and did education events, promoted responsible cat ownership, and we did a large program of trap, neuter, vaccinate, return for feral domestic cats. So this is what trap, neuter, release TNR looks like, uh, trapping feral cats, neutering them, vaccinating against disease, and then returning them uh, to where they were found. This was really the main uh, conservation action that was done by SWA. But it was not good news. What we found in all the priority areas was that we had a hybrid swarm structure. So the hybrid swarm is as bad as hybridization and introgression gets. You have a genetic continuum from a wildcat to a domestic cat. You have every hybrid in between. So this cat up here if you can see my pointer, uh, is in the top left. This was the best looking cat that we found. These are from Straths Bay priority area. Uh, this one was called Barry White. I didn't name him, uh, but he was called Barry White. 
And he was the best cat in Strasbourg. Um, he scored about 19 on the Pelage, which made him a wild cat. But his genetic score was about 62%. And we'll get onto genetics in just a second. But it's not, it's not a brilliant genetic score. But the saddest thing of all was that Barry White tested positive uh, for feline AIDS. So he had to be euthanized. So what that left was a lot of hybrids. And our program of work was to neuter those hybrids. This is another hybrid swarm. This is Angus. This is the same in all the priority areas. So this is harder to do not in person because I can't point to things, but we're going to tackle genetics quickly. So this is what a hybrid swarm looks like on a genetic basis. So a couple of things to explain. So I'm not a geneticist, but we'll just explain generally. The genetic test uh, that we used was developed by Helen Sen uh, at Wild Genes in, at the University of Edinburgh and, and uh, RZSS. So what the test does, not test the identify specific areas of the genetic code that differ. Uh -oh. We don't want an unstable internet connection during genetic discussion. Okay, it seems okay. So the genetic test, researchers identify areas of the genetic code that differ between wildcats and domestic cats. Obviously not many of them do because they're very closely related. They identify these loci that will differentiate between a wildcat and a domestic cat. And it's those that are involved in the test. So it's just testing a very specific um, part of the genome. This graph on the uh, y-axis, you have what's known as the hybrid score or Q score, which tells you how hybrid it is. You'll see that there is a line there at 0.75, and this is our cutoff, genetic cutoff for wildcat. Every one of these dots represents an individual cat and the confidence intervals of that Q score. If that lower confidence interval is above 0.75, it will be classed as a wildcat. If it is below, it's classed as a hybrid. So the genetic threshold for wildcat is a lower boundary of Q of 0.75 or 75%. And what that roughly equates to is a first generation back cross to a wildcat, which is a wildcat that's got three of its grandparents are wildcats and one grandparent was a domestic cat. And it's roughly 75% wildcat. That's the genetic threshold. So that's to make these graphs make more sense. So this is the most recent publication of genetics from Helen Sen et al in 2019. Um, and very briefly, all we're looking at here, this is captive cats. You can see that they all cluster very strongly in the wildcat end. Domestic cats cluster at the domestic cat end. And historic cats also cluster at the wildcat end. But when you look at anything recent, this is roadkill from 1990 to 2015. There are still some wildcats at this end. It will be the earlier samples, but you can see a full genetic continuum from one to the other. The scoping survey, this is samples from 2014. Everything is a hybrid. And these samples are from the priority areas work between 2015 and 2020. Nothing came out as a genetic wildcat. They were all hybrids. Obviously, this isn't very good news. So at the third year of Scottish Wildcat Action, uh, we commissioned an independent review of the conservation work uh, by the cat specialist group of the IUCN. We gave them all of our data and said, you know, what should we do now? They concluded that the population of wildcats in Scotland is no longer viable. So they're not completely extinct. There are still individuals out there with significant wildcat DNA but there are, they are too few and far between and hybridization is far too widespread. So without any interaction, they will just go extinct. The only option now is reintroduction or reinforcement from captive populations. Those introduced populations will require management intervention to prevent further hybridization. But what drives hybridization? we are on to part two of the talk. I've got no idea if you can hear me or anything because I can't see anybody's screens. <laughs> so I hope you're still there. 
and people are still with me. So I'm going to have a sip of water. Yes, Kerry, you're doing fine. Um, still there. Every now and then the sound goes a bit funny, but uh, but generally speaking, it's coming through good. Okay, great. It does keep warning me my internet connection is brilliant, but hopefully it's it's manageable. Um, okay. Oh, and by the way, we can see your pointer when you're moving it around as well. Excellent. Right. Okay. Good to know. Okay. So the drivers of hybridization. Hybridization. Cause or effect. So Scottish wildcare action described hybridization as the number one threat to wildcats. And it is widely viewed as the number one current threat to wildcats. Um, but is it the cause of extinction? The hybrid swarm is the end point of a process that began generations ago. Is hybridization better described as a consequence, perhaps, of population decline rather than a cause? And do our current conservation actions address the root causes or the drivers of introgressive hybridization? So by drivers of hybridization, I mean any process that reduces the reproductive isolation between a wild cat and domestic cat. So if they exist as two separate populations here, for example, if they're geographically separated, then there is reproductive isolation. And there can be reproductive isolation even if they're not geographically isolated. And at some point, that reproductive isolation can break down and the populations become permeable to hybridization. So what is it? that drives that process. Now, our work primarily looked at the domestic cat population as the driver. So it was suggested that the domestic cat population has increased hugely and the domestic cats have all infiltrated the wildcat habitat and that's what's driven hybridization. But what about the wildcat population? That must be equally, if not more important in driving hybridization. So unneutered domestic cat they're obviously a prerequisite for hybridization, but wildcats and domestic cats have coexisted for thousands of years. We know there's been historic episodes of hybridization in the past, nothing like the introgressive hybridization in the last couple of decades. So a hybrid swarm is not an inevitable consequence of domestic cat presence. And there's no evidence that Scotland has got a significantly higher density of unneutered domestic cats than anywhere else in Europe. If anything, we have very high compliance rates with neutering. We have a national cat welfare charity that does education and awareness raising about neutering and pays for it and does trap neuter release of feral domestic cats. So how can we look at the drivers of hybridization? We don't have any wild cats left to study it in. We've only got hybrids. So we can look at the past, but another way is to look at Europe. So Europe is like a natural experiment in terms of hybridization because the hybridization rates vary widely and they're always lower than they are here with the possible exception of Hungary, but we're not gonna talk about Hungary this evening. So generally hybridization rates are far lower across the continent. For example, in the UK, the hybridization rate is 100%. In Germany, it's estimated around 3.5%. France and Switzerland, perhaps between 10 and 30%. Uh, north of Spain is very, very low. Southern Spain is low. Portugal, Sicily are sort of medium levels. So you've got this variation in hybridization. It was previously thought that this could be a result of differences in the genetic methodology used to measure hybridization. That's very recently proven not to be the case. Um, I'll just explain this very briefly, but basically dark blue circles are good. Everything else is bad. Uh, Scotland is a disaster. Uh, Germany is looking pretty good. Most of these sites are good. Okay. Increasing hybridization in central Spain and Portugal. But it wasn't to do with genetic methodology. This paper analyzed all the samples in the same way. So they confirmed that there is genuine differences in hybridization across the continent. So I wanted to know why there are no other hybrid swarm populations. Scotland is different. Something is different about Scotland and we don't know what it is. So I was awarded this Churchill Fellowship to travel uh, across Europe, uh, which was great. 
and meet lots of researchers. These are the places that I visited. Uh, so to interview them, to look at their habitat uh, and to research their wildcat population. I've since been writing a very detailed literature review, which I've, I should, I'm about to finish. It's got very long um, and out of control. Um, but this was the, the motivation behind the Churchill Fellowship. So there's a huge amount of information and I'm gonna kind of try and distill some interesting points down to some case studies. But just to be clear, this is all, none of this is published or systematic research. This is just observation uh, and discussion uh, and literature review. Um, so these are kind of observations uh, for interest. So let's look at the place where there is low hybridization. Uh, and let's look at Germany. Germany uh, countrywide has a very low rate of hybridization around 3.5%. They've done extensive surveys. So they really know very well what the hybridization rate is. So we'll just concentrate on Hainich Forest in Thuringia, which is in the former Eastern Germany. Uh, and Hainich Forest is here. And this is where I visited in the South here. And Hainich Forest is home to a population of around 60 wildcats. And there are some features of Hainich uh, Forest that make that are are uh, quite useful for illustrating things that might be preventing hybridization. So the first one, oh, sorry, and I should say that the hybridization, the wildcat population in Hainich shows no hybridization and they have done uh, genetic testing uh, of cats in Hainich National Park and they haven't found any hybridization. So Hainich forest is uh, the largest area of deciduous forest in Germany. Uh, it's 160 square kilometers. And the southern part of it is a national park, Hainich National Park. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the wildcats. This is a central German wildcat. Interestingly, wildcats in the center of Germany and the southwest of Germany, which is where their two core populations are, are genetically distinct. And they probably recolonized Germany after the last ice age from different refuges. So the central German wildcats are different uh, from the southwestern ones. This is a central German wildcat. Um, you can see that he's very pale compared to our Scottish wildcats, and they describe wildcats in Germany as vervaschen or washed out. Wildcats in Germany are never described as tabby. They're not overtly stripy. They're generally quite faint. Uh, but you can really clearly see the line down the back, the four lines on the top of the head and the shoulder stripes. So this population of 50, 60 wildcats in Hainich uh, is living in this uh, national park and the national park designation is probably important. So national park status in Germany is IUCN category two national park, which means it is completely protected against any disturbance. So this 160 square kilometer deciduous woodland, you can only access it by very clearly delineated trails. There's these limited walkways the rest of it is very much undisturbed. Uh, the protected area status means that there is no development. Uh, there's very little forest management at all. Their watchword is Natur Natur sein lassen, which is like, let nature be nature. So within this habitat, it's very diverse. It's full of different tree species. It's full of deadwood. The small mammal populations are incredibly high. Um, there's lots of den sites. All these old trees in the middle of the forest have all these big holes and cavities in. Um, and there's lots of areas of open scrub uh, and open areas within the forest. And surrounding the forest are lots of open areas of scrub. And the collaring studies with wildcats showed that the wildcats like these edge habitats, probably because they're full of small mammals. Uh, so the wildcats generally were hunting and feeding in these edge habitats but this forest was supporting a very high density population of wildcats. And if we look at the human distribution uh, around Hainich Forest, you can see that humans don't really live in the forest. The human distribution is relatively far from the forest edge. I mean, relative compared to, for example, Scotland, where we have houses all in the forest, all along the outsides of the forest. In Germany, generally, people live in very clumped settlements. So there's these large buffer zones between people and their domestic cats and the wildcats. The wildcats live in the forest and they stay in the forest. The domestic cats don't go in the forest. 
they stay in the human supplements. So you've got spatial separation between wildcats and domestic cats. They also do a lot of habitat management for wildcat conservation. They launched the biggest biotope networking project for wildcat in the world called Safety Net for the Wildcat. And they planted 20,000 kilometers of migration corridor to defragment landscape. And they improved the habitat of the forest. It was called softening the edges and they made the edges softer with more diversity uh, so that there was increased biodiversity, increased prey species uh, for wildcats. So that's an example of a habitat where you get no hybridization. Another one is Northern Spain, Cantabrian mountains. Again, it's a protected area. This is Somiedo Natural Park, uh, where there is a very healthy wildcat population. Uh, here's one of them. This is a Northern Spanish wildcat. And in terms of domestic cats in Somiedo, there are many domestic cats in the towns and villages. There's no responsible ownership, none of them neutered and they're all kept outside. There's some spatial overlap between domestic cats and wild cats. They both hunt in these fields on the forest edges, particularly because they've got these montane water bowl and which are particularly high valuable prey species. And both the wild cats and domestic cats will hunt these. So they do occasionally overlap, but there's no evidence at all for hybridization. So what's preventing hybridization? It's probably something to do with the population density of wildcats. The forests are very productive. There's a lot of food. The timing of the breeding seasons. Domestic cat breeding season is generally in the spring and summer, whereas wildcat breeding season is over winter. And it might well be agonistic wildcat behavior. So Hector, who's the researcher who works in Northern Spain, has witnessed agonistic interactions between wildcats and domestic cats. So here's some of the habitat in northern Spain. Uh, it's really beautiful, very diverse, broadly deciduous forests, and the wildcats hunt in all these little patches. And this is a trail camera that we checked with Hector and there was uh, a bear on it, and uh, there were wild boar, and there was a wildcat uh, walking up and down this trail. And they hunt in these little fields here, and they have den sites there. And this is the montane water vole habitat and the traditional agricultural practices encourage high density populations of montane water vole. And here's a wildcat with a montane water vole. So there's ecological and ethological barriers here. There's spatial overlap. They hunt in the fields together during the summer, but that's outside wildcat breeding season. And there's a feeding motivation. They're there in those fields for hunting, not for breeding. So the encounters are agonistic. So the reproductive isolation is maintained, this time by intra-guild competition. So to summarize, high quality wildcat habitat equals high wildcat population density. You need spatial separation between wildcats and domestic cats, and you get no hybridization. Southern Spain has a slightly different mechanism. It has a very low population density of wildcats. They've been in steep decline due to persecution, and probably also intraguild predation. They have an unbalanced predator population. So there's a lot of red foxes which kill or predate upon kittens. There are very diverse habitats in Southern Spain and the primary food is rabbits. And you can see this is all a huge forested area here in the Sierra Arana, which is here on the map. There's also cats here in Sierra Nevada. So this is all broadleaf deciduous oak forest. And then this is planted pine forest on the side here. So they have very diverse habitat. They have oak forests here. Uh, these are full of rodents. Cats hunt rodents in these uh, oak forests. I think sometimes people picture these Mediterranean habitats as just empty bare scrub, but there's actually very large fragments of, of oak forest. But there is also a lot of scrub habitat, juniper scrub, but it's very diverse, it's very structured uh, and it's full of rabbits. And these are some other examples of rabbit habitat. Now, because this is Mediterranean and rabbits are native, rabbits are very important prey species here uh, for wildcats. Now, none of these habitats looks like a very good wildcat habitat. They look bare, there's very little cover, you wouldn't imagine there's any food, uh, but the wildcats still occupy them. And it's because there's rabbits 
and they're denning in places like old barns and one even had kittens in an old buzzard nest that was in the middle of this tree. So we think that possibly rabbits allow wildcats to occupy relatively suboptimal habitat. And there's one with a rabbit. Mediterranean wildcats are a bit more darkly striped than the Western Central European cats. So there's strong spatial segregation. There's a low density wildcat population it's fragmented and there's high persecution. There's very high domestic cat population. Again, there's no responsible cat ownership. So why is there no hybridization? We think it's this low opportunity because there's strong spatial separation, which is facilitated by niche separation. The wildcats are eating rabbits in the scrub and in the forest and the domestic cats depend on people in villages. And there's intra-guild predation. There's really high predator diversity associated with rabbits in Mediterranean systems. So essentially it's just too dangerous for domestic cats to occupy this habitat. So we're going to look very briefly at places where there is some hybridization. And I might just skim through this a little bit. So this is a state in Germany called Baden-Württemberg, which is in the southwest here. And this is an area where wildcats are recolonizing. Now, even though the national rate of hybridization is three and a half percent in Baden-Württemberg, it's more like between 20, 10 and 20 percent. So the rate is higher and it's possibly related to recolonization. So they're recolonizing these human dominated landscapes. Uh, this is the Rhine. This is France on this side and Germany. So they've, the floodplain forests is where they're occupying and this here called the Kaiserstuhl. So here are some German wildcats. Uh, southwestern German wildcats. This is a wildcat here. Uh, what this is this one actually swam across the Rhine River uh, and occupied an island here for a couple of days. These are back crosses to wildcat. So these are a type of hybrid. These are average genetic 75% wildcats. You can see that the patterns are already breaking down. Um, and this is an F1 called Pinot. And you can see that the pattern really has broken down quite a lot here. Uh, this is an F1, so it's 50% wildcat, 50% domestic cat. So they've got a relatively high hybridization rate. So they looked at spatial habitat use to see if that could explain it. Um, so they've got very diverse, very structured forests here. The females stay inside the forest and they have very small home ranges and the males wander a lot further. So this shows female home ranges next to the river. So you can see they are really small, which means that that forest probably is a very productive habitat. They don't need to go outside of those forests. These are 1.6 square kilometer home ranges. In Scotland, we have female cats that are up to 30 square kilometers. The average is about 15 square kilometers. So they have very small home ranges because the habitat is very productive. The wildcats stay in the forest. So these are wildcat home ranges and the red is settlements. So you can see that the wildcats are staying in the forest and they're not going to the human settlements. They're occupying very high densities with very small home ranges. Domestic cats do not go in the forests. They were also collared. And responsible cat ownership is relatively high. That might be the reason that hybridization is not more extensive. You might expect it to be a lot higher than 20% at the moment. Um, they think that possibly the hybrid events are coming from, possibly from farms. So the settlements and farms are often very close to the edge. Farm cats often aren't neutered. Hybridization event events might originate from these few unneutered domestic males that are living on the edge of the forest habitat. So the genetics showed that the hybrid offspring were from domestic male cats and female wild cats which is the opposite way around to how it normally happens. And one reason that could be is because mortality is very high among young male wildcats. They have a big problem with road mortality in Germany. It could be differentially affecting young males. They could have fewer males defending the females, more hybridization. And lastly, and very briefly, very high hybridization or increasing hybridization in central Spain. Here's a wildcat from 2013, relatively good looking on the pelage and more recent photos from 2018. 
you can see the pelage is starting to break down. You've got these blotchy patterns. They look more like Scottish wildcats. And it could well be related to land management practices in central Spain. Land is managed for game hunting. More than 80% of territory in central Spain is covered by hunting estates. 99% of those have predator control. Small game is related to intensive predator control using indiscriminate and often illegal methods. There's very low wildcat abundance in areas with small game management. High red deer and boar density, so big game, they're associated with very low rabbit and rodent populations and low wildcat density. So any game uh, hunting is bad for wildcats. A tracking study showed that males and females occupy extremely large home ranges. One female was 53 square kilometers. The domestic cats are only in the farms and settlements. So the conclusions were that wildcats were having to go a very long way to find anything to breed with or any food. So some general conclusions just to end. Barriers to hybridization. Large areas of continuous deciduous woodland habitat with no disturbance, lots of prey and lots of cover. Protected area designations are important. Wildcats survive in protected areas. It's probably not just uh, about them being protected from being killed, but probably also restrictions on human occupation of those habitats that are important. A high density wildcat population acts as a barrier, seems to act as a barrier to hybridization. Spatial separation from humans and their domestic cats and niche separation from domestic cat. So basically this, if it looks like this, you can have wildcats in there. Drivers of hybridization on the other hand, Habitat loss, loss of natural prey, high mortality, loss of resources, and the primary ecological niche. Increased occupation of human dominated landscapes. Forest cats become field cats. So, lastly, why do we have a hybrid swarm? It's probably related to the extent of the human modification of the landscape. Land is managed for game hunting, widespread predator control, and the loss of a predator guild that might impact domestic cat movement. There's no effective legal protection. Hybrids are not protected. Until you can uh, legally protect hybrids, you've got still a problem with identifying the difference between wildcats and hybrids. Habitat loss is a problem, deforestation, the dependence on rabbits, and then the widespread decline in rabbits may have been a significant factor. Dispersed human and domestic cat distribution throughout the most productive habitats. So we live in the farms, the forests and the fields where all the food is. The loss of the wildcat ecological niche and we have a hybrid swarm. Future strategy, hybridization is a consequence of population decline that's caused by a range of anthropogenic factors. Future conservation strategy in Scotland has to address those underlying causes. Habitat management can probably play a role in preventing hybridization, but domestic cat population management is going to continue to play an important role in Scotland. And I'd like to thank all the people that I visited on the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust uh, and say thank you to my colleague Alice, uh, who accompanied me on the trip. Uh, and I would just like to say that I am, so I'm, my position now uh, is the field manager with the new conservation project Saving Wildcats but this talk was not affiliated with that work in any way because it was sort of all arranged prior to that. So this is, this is not to do with saving wildcats. This is just my own personal uh, experience and views and opinions. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kerry, uh, for that excellent coverage of the situation. Um, if we can uh, perhaps address one or two questions, we're we're running quite uh, uh, quite long at the moment, so uh, perhaps we won't take too many questions. But uh, but one or two have come in. Um, if I could start by, by saying, uh, could you clarify for me uh, why the hybridisation in Scotland became so much more serious in the 70s and 80s. I just couldn't quite understand what the change was that, uh, that caused that. Well, I mean, the, the honest answer is that we don't know. 
I think we can infer that there was, it was a perfect storm of uh, a culmination of rapidly increasing persecution with rapidly improved methods, um, but probably the rabbit population decline was a major factor um, because wildcats in Scotland are probably very dependent on rabbits because the habitat is relatively suboptimal compared to other places in Europe where they're more dependent on rodents. So it was probably a, a related to the dramatic decrease in prey availability coupled with further declines from persecution. So you just have fewer, fewer and fewer wildcats and that probably resulted in the acceleration after that. But we, we don't know. This effectively is, is sort of our best guess speculation um, because we don't know for definite. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, just glancing down the list here. Uh, Dominic Woods is asking, um, you've said that protected area designations are very important. Um, but the Scottish government position and JNCC guidelines um, suggest that that designation will not help as a conservation tool. What, what, could you address that? What is your uh, opinion on that situation? Um, well, as I've said, all I'm presenting are general observations on the factors that correlate with healthy wildcat populations. So generally, protect wildcat populations with low hybridization are found in areas that are protected, probably because they were less exposed to some of these factors that can drive hybridization. So they weren't exposed to rapid population decline uh, or further habitat loss or human occupation. Um, so it doesn't mean that you can't have uh, a wildcat population without a protected area designation. Um, but it correlates with a healthy wildcat population for fairly obvious reasons, I think. Okay. Um, uh, Gavin is asking, Gavin Hoseman is asking, uh, with, with the move towards carbon zero and consequential tree planting uh, being encouraged, it must surely be an opportunity to plant the right mix of tree species in the right place in densities to create a better habitat for the wildcats. Uh, is anything being done to influence that uh, trend? Yeah, so that is a, certainly a positive trend. And we know that wildcat population expansions in the past have correlated with reforestation. So I think uh, the direction of increased forest cover uh, is going to be important, but the quality also matters. Um, so they have to provide, essentially, I mean, wildcats across the distribution will occupy other habitat types. They preferentially seem to occupy deciduous woodland, but they just need resources. They need cover, prey, lack of human disturbance. So if, if the habitat will provide that, then you can support these populations. And there's no reason you can't have a healthy low density wildcat population, but it probably puts you at higher risk of hybridization. So the more you can do to facilitate these high density populations, and to do that, you need high quality habitat with high prey populations. So it's definitely part of future wildcat conservation strategy is habitat management to facilitate cover and prey, high density populations. That's what you want going forward because it's protective against hybridization. And, and to what extent would uh, reintroduction, uh, breed, captive breeding and reintroduction be a factor in that? Well, it's, it's essentially the only strategy that we've got left um, because it's, it's sort of like that. You've got a pond, uh, this is how someone in Portugal uh, describes it. You've got a pond next to a factory and a pond is polluted. Um, and the way you stop the pollution, you turn off the tap, uh, but then you need to put water in to dilute it down. So the only way really that we can, I mean, it's not a great analogy because we still have domestic cats coming in, but the only way we can reverse this is by putting in more cats 
uh, with a higher wildcat genetic component. So it, it is the last strategy that we've got left now that, that will work. Um, so it, it will be the next phase uh, of, of conservation. And that is the, the hope is that we can, we can manage uh, the situation in a way that will prevent future hybridization. Um, Nikki Hulse has asked, could, is it possible for us to arrange for you to show the slide with the identifying features again? Yes. Um, whilst we perhaps carry on talking. This one? Be. Not come up on me yet. Oh, that's because I'm not sh okay. Screen sharing. There we go. That one. Yes, there we go. And perhaps you ought to just uh, talk briefly round the round the pelage just to remind people the seven points. Yes, I did all that very quickly, so I have to apologize for that. Um, I'm sort of used to saying these things uh, a lot, and I sort of assume it, that everybody knows how to pelage score a wildcat. But yeah, there's seven main features. The, the, very, the diagnostic ones uh, and the ones that they use um, more widely in Europe tend to be the dorsal line, uh, the shape of the tail, and the tail bands. Uh, the two shoulder stripes and the head stripes are also fairly diagnostic, but the stripes and the spots on the sides are not a particularly good indicator. And I should say that we have been looking at how the pelage classification relates to the genetic result. And there's not, uh, in recent samples, there's not a particularly good correlation anymore between the pelage and the genetic result. Um, we think it's broken down because the level of hybridization is so high. Um, so it's it still works in Europe, but uh, for Scotland now, the Pelage score is not a reliable indicator. But what it generally means, the genetic score is always low. That's the problem. So it's not that you get a cat that looks not very good and it scores really high genetically. That doesn't happen. It's the other way around. You can get cats that still look relatively good, but they always have disappointing genetic scores. So that that relationship is breaking down, but it's still there's still reliable indicators of wildcat ancestry. You've got a line that stops here, and a fat tail with rings is definitely a good proportion of wildcat in there somewhere. Um, so we it's still a reliable tool, and it's the best one that we have for. Uh, ID in the wild. So, um, if if that uh, if that is the case that basically all the the homegrown cats are disappointing genetically, is um, the question has been raised as to whether it's whether we should be bringing in genetic input from Europe, and if so, where? Yeah. So the the future. Um, so I, I won't talk about saving wildcats as though I'm a, a staff member, but the future strategy of that project will involve some contribution of cats from Europe. Um, the, the details of that will be, you know, assessed by all the, the genetic experts and the people who manage the captive population. Um, but there will be, there will be cats brought in from Europe or just genetic contribution of cats from Europe to that. And they'll be captive cats, so they're not wild caught cats. Um, but the, the ex situ management is run by a collection of breeders <coughs> throughout the UK and throughout Europe. So all these things are done by these, you know, official zoo channels. That's not the side of the project that I work in. I'm much more focused on uh, cats in the wild. So I, I wouldn't like to hazard too many guesses about exactly where they're getting. But that stuff, that's, that's sort of still under development, I would say. Okay, and, and perhaps finally this, this point, if there were to be reintroductions, um, 
Is, is there anywhere else in the UK other than Scotland that one might consider it? Uh, for instance, uh, for, uh, parts of Wales or or even in some as part of some project like the NEP uh, project, would, would that be viable to consider something like that? Well, there are certainly there are projects at the moment that are looking at uh, potential reintroductions in England. Uh, there's a feasibility assessment being done um, for reintroductions in England and Wales. Um, I think there are there are pros and cons. Um, the habitat might be better, but there's going to be still very significant problems with um, feral domestic cat populations because we don't have very big areas of forest where people don't live. So they, none of these things are gonna be easy. They're gonna require a lot of sort of adaptive management. For cats that get, will be released in Scotland, they'll all be GPS collared. There'll be extensive post-release monitoring um, and constant adaptive management of how, how those cats live and survive in this environment and, and what needs to be done to protect them from the threats. So I would guess something like that would be common to any approach wherever it was done. But I think these things are potentially feasible, but it's always difficult for predators because they require quite big, a lot of space. And we don't have a lot of space in the UK. Um, but it's, it's probably always, it's probably worth a go and see what happens. <laughs> And hope for the best. Okay, hope for the best. I think that's it. That's a good line to finish on. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kerry, for your excellent, excellent talk and excellent uh, answers. Um, unless you have uh, a, a, a rounding up comment that you want to make, then I think we should hand back to Alison to uh, round off the evening. Yeah, well, thank you, Kerry, very much indeed. I mean, it really was an excellent overview. It was um, very comprehensive, very clear, great to get the historical context. But, you know, in sa some ways, it seems like it was almost like a sad sort of negative, perfect storm of factors over the last 200 years that have, um, you know, caused this decline. Because, you know, when you go to Scotland, you know, there are huge sort of empty areas, but they're obviously just not empty enough and not the right sort of habitat. But I suppose the good news is that there are cousins of our Scottish wildcat on the mainland doing well. And, you know, roll back 11,000 years and they were kind of all together. So, you know, I think it, we can take sort of comfort from the fact that if we do manage to get our habitat better sorted out, um, it's not at least it's not like the last European wildcat is going. It's reassuring to know. And it does sound like you had a fantastic um, opportunity and really made the most of that to find out, you know, what would be available. So it was it's really fantastic to hear this, even though it's a bit of a sad story of, you know, almost extinction going on on our doorstep. And we tend to think of that in tropical rainforests and things. But, you know, we're just as, um, you know, we're just the same as the rest of the world, that this is a a bad time for wildlife and biodiversity and we have to um, do our bit. So um, I'm sure you will do everything you can to keep Scottish wildcats going in Scotland. And thank you very much indeed. Um, the only thing I have to say now is that our next talk, well, I'd also just like to thank the Royal Society of Biology for being here with us. And we should have said, please stay in your questions, which group you're from, but we didn't say that, but I think it's been great to share ideas and hopefully this will be the beginning of a positive um, liaison and we can hopefully have some face-to-face -face talks in the future and maybe get carried back in a couple of years to meet us all in um, Oxford. Although I think at this time when you've just taken on a new job, it probably would have been, um, might have been quite complicated. So maybe we should be grateful that we've had the chance to do this online. Anyway, huge thank you. And just to say, our next talk will be actually on the first Monday of December, because we usually do that to um, have a little removal from Christmas, although I think we're all going to be probably on Zoom for most of December anyway. And um, 
local bat expert Keith Cohen will be talking, giving a talk entitled Tree Mendus, the roosting use of tree holes by British bats. So we'll be able to think of all our little batty friends um, curled up in their um, hibernation roosts and um, Keith will give us some insight into the amazing ways that, tree, that bats make use of trees. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kerry, for an excellent talk. Thank you, Kerry Broom and all your um, biologists for being with us. And I wish you all a good night. <laughs>